Engaging the community since 1970. This is WIS Awareness. Thanks so much for joining me this morning on Awareness. I'm your host, Leland Pender. March 31st was International Trans Day of Visibility. And around that time, and certainly in the weeks and months leading up to that time, um, trans issues were a bit of a topic in South Carolina. Some state lawmakers were working to restrict access to health care and medical um, uh, procedures for uh, trans people, as well as limit their participation in some sports activities in our state. So first, First, I want to bring in Dr. Bambi Gaddis. She is the CEO of the Wright Wellness Center. And uh, Greg Green is here this morning as well. He is uh, the director of the Transgender Awareness Alliance. Good morning to you both, and thanks for being here. What are some of the key issues of high priority facing the transgender community and transgender citizens right now? Unfortunately, um, our community has not always been understanding uh, and educated on the uh, issues around transgender community. Our, our organization, the Right Wellness Center, for the last 27 years have been advocates, uh, we've been supporters, and, and really want to continue to be a space of protection. As we look at the uh, unfortunate large number of, of citizens who don't understand the trans community, we're concerned about the levels of depression and suicide that we've seen in this community. And much of it is part of uh, a response to uh, a discrimination and lack of understanding about who transgender people are. Part of our goal is to magnify uh, transgender community as, as citizens, as taxpayers, as advocates, as, as uh, change makers in our community uh, who not only contribute, but certainly um, need to be protected. And so, Greg, tell us about when you, you hear, you know, you're learning about these um, lawmakers who present these bills to become law. The Youth Gender Reassignment Prevention Act is the one, that's its, its proper name that I was referring to earlier, uh, preventing people 18 and under from accessing medical care, medical treatment for um, trans uh, reassignment surgery. What do you, what does that do to the community, especially those who are young as they navigate this issue that's complex enough without anyone else making it more complex. What does that do to those individuals? The main thing that's going to happen is you're going to start to see a lot of folks who are having, who have mental, will have a mental health crisis. You're not validating that child. You're not validating that person. And it's not just about that person. The way this law is, you're not validating and respecting a family's choice to take care of their child the way they feel it is best. Um, the WPATH organization, which is the um, World Professional Association for Transgender Health, it basically said, let the professionals do their jobs. There are doctors who know child care, who know adolescent care, who know the pros and cons of what it means to transition at an early age. You have folks who have done the studying, who have done the work, and you have parents who are accepting their children. And now you have lawmakers who have no, no, you know, relation to this field who are wanting to stop this from happening only because of their own fears and their own um, personal biases. And so I, I guess I have to play devil's advocate a little bit here. One of the arguments is that, um, you know, when you're that young as a, a teenager, high school student, what have you, even younger than that, you don't really know who you are, or what you want, or what you might think you um, are in the future. And that's such a big thing to undertake at that stage of your youth. So how do you respond to that argument? Well, I mean, when do you know who you are, right? If you are a cisgender person, and that's someone who um, gender assignment at birth matches who they are um, and who they feel they are. Um, if when did you know uh, that you were male? If you just know. There's no age. There's no um, light that comes on that tells you who you are. You just know who you are. And then the world starts to put their perceptions into how you should act. The world starts to give you these uh, gender norms to fit for yourself, but you know at a very young age who you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and being devil's advocate, like you said, a lot of times there's this, well, the kids will regret it. You know, if this is irreversible, there's going to be regret. First of all, there's been no studies to back that up. And as far as any regret in adults who have transitioned, there's only one to 3% of adults who may, who have regretted 
their condition, that number is way lower than those who have had other types of medical interventions for whatever reason. Um, say, you know, some kind of plastic surgery or whatever elective surgeries that someone may have. Uh, I say that carefully because I don't feel like transitional care is an elective surgery. But when you talk about folks who have had elective surgeries, the regret of them doing that is way greater than one to three percent. So all of that is really a moot point. We don't have the research to prove it. There's nothing to prove it. Again, it's still deeply based in people's personal bias. And Dr. Gaddis, uh, you know, one of the main focuses of your work is addressing, you know, how stigma largely impacts these issues, in particular access to health care and um, just how detrimental that it is. These are your words here and continues to fuel epidemics that could be curtailed if the public was less homophobic and less transphobic. Um, you know, how do you how do you see that happening? How do you measure when we're at that point? Well, I, a part of this is you know, what preparation is our community, is our educational system playing in helping bridge the gap of misunderstanding uh, of when we talk about uh, people's uh, gender identity um, and uh, these differences, as, as Mr. Green has talked about, uh, about how people are anatomically assigned versus in their head, in their psychiatric, in their psychological being, who are they? Even when we talk to uh, uh, LGBT and, and the same questions are posed, which is, when did you know? Um, from all of my, my studies and all of our conversations, because part of this is, when was, are we actually talking to the community? Um, you know, part of this this uh, in t intention of creating bills and laws and policies to govern other people's lives is, is really steeped in our inability or refusal to actually sit down with that community and talk. And so we don't have the foundation for uh, c transparent and authentic conversation. So we look at comprehensive school health. The law clearly outlines, it says that in uh, CHE law, we are not permitted, teachers are not permitted to engage in any kind of conversation with their classes outside of heterosexuality in the context of marriage. That statement alone lends itself toward lack of understanding and our inability to prepare our children, but it also ignores their existence and their visibility and us acknowledging them. And so one of the recommendations that that um, I certainly would have as a former health consultant with that uh, department and want to give shout out to Molly Spearman, the superintendent, because she clearly understood that when we talked about this bill that would not allow a, a high school student to participate in sports, she had the vision and understanding to know that all children have the right to participate in uh, 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 productive activities that build their character, their decision-making, friendships, and those kinds of things. But that being said, I think there's a call for the legislature to go back and look at CHE law and to go back and revisit, is this law keeping speed or is it up to speed with the lives and the realities of South Carolina citizens? And in this case, we have an opportunity to integrate new legislation that says that these kinds of conversations about gender identity must be included in instruction to our children so they are prepared and edified in who they are and who they can become. Welcome back this morning. Uh, before the break, Dr. Gaddis, you mentioned it. The um uh, its proper name is the Save Women's Sports Act that has now, you know, kind of been shelved or rejected in this session in the State House. So for the moment, it's no longer a thing, but lawmakers have said they do plan to bring it up again in the future. But for right now, it's, it's been rejected um, in the State House. But it was still a hot topic and, and very heavily debated for several, several weeks. So um, talk to us about that. Um, first of all, just the name of it, you know, Save Women's Sports Act. That seems to give the impression that 
you know, women's sports are currently under under siege or being overtaken by something or I guess an issue from, from my view that certainly isn't the case. I guess my point is the title of it seems a little bit misleading or deceptive and I wanted to get your take on that. The title is very deceptive and misleading. I mean, there is nothing, it's, there's n there is no attack on women's sports. If you're truly uh, wanting to address transgender students in athletics, you're completely ignoring trans men, uh, tra trans men, right? Because your, your focus, the focus of this bill is really just pushing the idea of men playing in women's sports. And that's not the case because trans women are women, regardless of age. A trans woman is a woman. So to say save women's sports, you're completely, again, you're actually still even ignoring the other part of the transgender spectrum. Um, like Dr. Gaddis said, Superintendent Spearman has done a great job in saying that this is not something that we need to focus on. This is not something that um, is going to be helpful for our students because all students deserve the right to play sports. Playing sports builds camaraderie. You learn about yourself. You learn about, you know, taking care of your teammates and things like that. So having students be, uh, being able to play sports, I mean, it's fundamental, you know. In addition to that, um, one of the things that, was, uh, that she also mentioned um, was building the relationship within the team and within the classmate with the student. When you're constantly pushing these students around, going back to the mental health issue, you have students who may not be accepted at home. You have students who may not be accepted anywhere they go. And the only place they can be accepted with is with their peers who happen to be playing a sport. Now you're telling them they cannot do that. That's a, I mean, you're not giving a lot of room for the growth and the mental care for that student. There's also already policy in place right now. There's something that students can get signed um, through, I believe it's the, um, uh, the, the high school league. So you can get, basically, you can get something signed saying, this is who I am and this is the sport I like to play in, and then they can approve it. There has only been, I believe, four or five applications. Two, have, two to three, I believe, have been approved. I think this was two. I, I think it's within the last year or so. Mm -hmm. So it's not even a whole lot of students that this is affecting. Your, your, this bill is being presented, and it doesn't affect that many people. There are so many more bills that could be presented right now that we need to get done for the citizens of South Carolina. That focusing on the trans community is really just asking. So, and I do want to say um, and, there were lawmakers who made the same point, and the reason, part of the reason the bill was rejected is because they said the same thing. They, the people who brought the bill forward didn't kind of demonstrate that this was something that was pressing or needed, needed to be addressed. Um, and I want to ask you about something you, you said in your comments there, um, ignoring the other spectrum or the other end of the trans spectrum. Why do you think there's not, you know, if we're going to have this issue in this conversation, why is it not also surrounding trans men? Trans men are invisible. Trans men are invisible because it is easy for us to blend in with society, to blend in with the community, to, to transition and move on with our lives. Um, in my opinion, it's really based on the, the misogyny of the way the world is built. And people feel that people would rather have a, what they feel is a weak man rather than a strong woman doing something. And because of that built misogyny within our culture, mm -hmm. that's why trans men are so invisible. When you see, um, even in the LGB community, right? If you're talking in the LGB, LGB community, you have gay men who have a much harder time than women who identify as lesbians because people don't feel the, the same level of threat, personal threat, which I will never understand. It's a fear that's unnecessary. And when you don't understand something or when you're ignorant to something, you're afraid of it. When you fear something, that fear can very, very easily slide into the lane of hate. And that's where all of this com comes from, ignorance. And Dr. Gaddis, um, I want to ask you, what, what are the reasons that you believe just kind of generally explain the hostility and just aggressive uh, nature 
from the general public towards the idea of trans rights? Um, I mean, we've talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of the things. I mean, obviously, it's a lack of understanding and information. Um, but then we, we look at what is even the cause of our desire to censor information. And unfortunately, you know, and I say this as a, as a believer, um, uh, much of our, we're, we're still struggling from a religious perspective about how the faith community sees um, gender identity. Um, and there, and we could get into a lot of uh, conversation that this time will not allow us to discuss, but I think it's what it calls us as, as people of faith. Uh, as Christians and those of us that espouse to be that, uh, is, is we're being called to look at, are we part of the solution? Are we part of the problem? Um, do What have we done as, as believers to increase our knowledge and be uh, a, a space of protection if we really believe in human rights, if we really believe that, that God sees us all the same, that we are all his children? then let us begin to increase our awareness and conversation with the trans members of the trans community, persons uh, who identify as uh, LGBTQ. Um, and, and even if we get confused about the, the, the terminology, ask, clear it up, and let's sit down as people, uh, uh, as one, and, and figure out together how do we mobilize ourselves because at the end of the day, um, anything and any situation that does not allow people to become fully who they are, that denies them their civil rights, access to health care is certainly something that I don't think um, that our faith supports. Okay, another quick break here on Awareness This Morning. We will be right back. And welcome back this morning, uh, Dr. Gaddist and Greg. I wanted to ask you, you know, obviously overall, though, when you think about, you know, um, youth today and just kind of how the world is currently, um, there certainly is more um, understanding of trans issues or certainly more of a desire to want to understand us and just general openness to many different um, uh, ways to live your life that are not just, you know, I guess, quote unquote, traditional and what was so so normal or, or promoted or seen as normal and common, you know, decades ago. Uh, would you agree with that or would you not agree with that or a little bit of both? You know, there's always people on both sides of really any issue. There are always people on both sides of any issue. Um, I feel that right now a lot of uh, younger citizens here in South Carolina are really looking to be all inclusive. Um, so many people have had to fight for a friend, for themselves, for a family member, and it's just really the change that's happening. There's so much change happening in the world right now. People being able to live their authentic selves without harming other people really sh is not an not an issue for this for this generation. And, and I want to add that I, I think it's important that we just really stay focused on, you know, th there's a segment of population that believes that this is a choice for many people. You know, they chose that. When in fact, I, I would suggest that, especially when we talk about transgender community, that this, they, this is not a choice. This is who I am. And that's a whole other mindset. Uh, the community uh, misunderstanding about uh, this this ability to just change up who you are, that one day you can be one thing and the next day you're something else. Um, yes, there are those of us that have had the opportunities to choose how we behave in one situation or another. Um, but I would suggest again that certainly for the trans community, if you were to talk to them intimately, they will tell you they've always felt this way, that they can't turn it off, that they can't become something else. And some of the heinous um, procedures that in the past we have used to try to reconform or get folks to re-identify themselves have, have been egregious. And we can never go back to those days and the things that we did in the early days to try to make someone become something they're not. 
And so I want to walk that fine line in this conversation and say that part of our the general population's responsibility is to, again, increase their education and awareness by talking to one another as human beings and gaining an understanding of diversity and how people see the world because we're all God's children. And so if there's someone out there who maybe they have a family member or a friend who's trans and they, they just don't quite know how to approach the topic or the issue or that person, uh, how do they do that? What are some places to go, resources for them to take a look at or get involved with? And kind of a two-part question here uh, for the, the trans community, what uh, resources are available to them? I would definitely say for those who are looking to support your family members, do some research online as, as well as looking for organizations like PFLAG, Parents and Friends of the LGBT Community. Um, PFLAG is very helpful, again, for parents, for friends, and for family members. The Upstate, there's Gender Benders, which is a very supportive um, organization as well as Campaign for Southern Equality. Campaign for Southern Equality has a lot of things on their website. I believe it's campaignforsouthernequality.org. And you can find a lot of resources there as a transgender individual, as well as, as someone who um, is an ally to our community. Uh, there's also Alliance for Full Acceptance, or AFA, and We Are Family there in the Low Country. Here in Columbia is my organization, Transgender Awareness Alliance, uh, where we help folks with name changes, gender marker changes, finding proper health care, um, and other ways that we can, that we can assist uh, the transgender community. Um, we do that here as well. And as far as learning more, I actually wrote a book. It's called Audacity, Memoirs of Transitioning, and it's a little bit of my story. Uh, my transition began in 2011, and it's a lot of ups and downs. I lost friends, uh, family that doesn't talk to me anymore, a job, everything. Like, my whole life changed, but I don't regret it, and I am, this is, this is who I am, and I am very happy with the decisions that I've made to be Greg and to be the man that you see in front of you today. And he's certainly a mentor to me. Um, I do appreciate who he is. Um, and uh, I think that these are the kind of relationships that b help bridge um, uh, misunderstanding. And, and, and I also want to just acknowledge that Wright Wellness Center remains a space of protection. And so I do want to encourage you to call us if there's anything we can do um, to assist. All right, that will have to do for now. So thanks again, Greg and Dr. Gaddist. And another quick break. We'll be right back here on Awareness. Thanks for watching this morning, and thanks to Greg Green and Dr. Bambi Gaddist for coming on the program today. Uh, have a great rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you next week.